This week, can tech save the world? We've got plastic soup, solar islands, and recycled cars. Planet Earth is under attack from us. We are depleting its resources, contaminating its waters and poisoning its air. And nature is responding. This week, world leaders have come together once again at the UN's climate conference in Poland. On the agenda, the latest findings from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which contain damning results. We are failing to meet the targets to slow down global warming. If we don't take action, the collapse of our civilizations and the extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. Meanwhile, some at the highest levels of power are still not convinced. Yeah, I don't believe it. No, no, I don't believe it. This, despite rigorous scientific models and increasingly vocal warnings from nearly all of the scientific community. We know from insurance how much money we're losing every year to Hydromet. It's hundreds of billions of dollars each year. It's happening. Eventually, this will hit people enough that people will start acting. And we can act. We can use less energy. We can just use less in general. The less we consume, the less will discard. We're all told how much we throw away every single day, but wow, I have to say, this place really rams it home. This is where the mixed recycling bins outside our homes end up, so they can be sorted into different materials. This is a really mechanical way of sorting the recycling into different sizes and shapes. Smaller, lighter bits of paper get thrown over the top the smaller, heavier objects fall through the gaps and the heavier and larger objects roll down these wheels to be collected at the bottom. And the speed these things are travelling through this place is incredible. This plant can sort 230 tonnes of waste in a day. That's almost 30 trucks worth, although it's just a fraction of what we throw away. And the problem is not all of our plastic ends up in the recycling. And even then, not all of it can be recycled. I think the truth is, a lot of us pop the plastic into the recycling bin and we think that's it, job done, our conscience is clear. But of course, it's nowhere near as simple as that. But there are some people who have decided to deal with plastics in a much more drastic manner. Well, it all started at home. During um, the preparation of our dinner, first we decided to uh, try to experience zero waste at home to avoid contributing constantly to this tremendous problem all around the world. At the end, when we as a consumer, and a lot of consumers, um, don't buy this anymore, the industry doesn't make this anymore. So I thought, well, what can I do with, uh, with waste plastic? Can I build something out of that? And not a toy or a sculpture or a, a, a durable thing, but something useful. Everybody said, well, you can't do this. It's not possible. Meet Lisbeth and Edwin, two ordinary people with extraordinary ambitions. They've spent the past three years designing and building a solar-powered vehicle that's almost entirely made of plastic from the rubbish bin. 
And we're not just talking about a vehicle to drive on their local flat Dutch roads. No, this is one built to withstand the toughest conditions. Antarctica. The couple will drive 2,400 kilometers from Union Glacier to the South Pole and back in a car made from rubbish. They want to show just how wasteful it is to throw away plastic in the quantities that we do. Another way of thinking about uh, waste. Waste isn't waste, waste is valuable. Uh, it's raw material. It's not at the end of its life cycle, but at the beginning. This is uh, actually the raw material which uh, we used building the solar Voyager. It is collected by uh, children from the primary school. Uh, we call it uh, urban mining. They sorted the waste plastics on types and they have cleaned it and made these chips out of it. While doing this, the children ask, uh, are you happy? Is this okay? How many we already have collected and how nice the material is? And what you see is that they are starting to feel more attached with the material because they do not see it as waste, they see it as raw ma material for building the solar for it. The plastic shreds are melted into a filament for a 3D printer. 30 of these have been working continuously for six weeks to produce a 4,000 piece plastic jigsaw puzzle designed to fit together to make the shell, the interior and two trailers. But this is only the flat parts. We also have those, which can give us the flexibility to make all kinds of shapes. To test the durability, the couple took the vehicle to Iceland in April. The pace looks slow, and it is four kilometers an hour but they plan to drive the solar Voyager during every hour of Antarctic sunlight that's available, which at this time of year is 24 hours a day. And so in continuous shifts of three hours, they'll navigate some of the trickiest terrain on Earth. What I can see in this data is where the crevasses are, but this data is from half a year ago, maybe one year ago but the crevasses, they are always in the same area. Maybe they've changed 10 or 50 meters, but I can warn them a few days in the head that they are, well, getting into a crevasse area. Henk Jans is running the mission back at base in the Netherlands. He's watching the terrain, the vehicle's progress, and the weather, which can be just as treacherous as those moving crevices. There's a lot of ice, so hopefully, the car will manage. Wednesday, the 28th of November. The Solar Voyager has arrived at base camp. After years of prep, it's day one of the mission. We're heading for South Pole. At the moment, with a speed of uh, 2.5 knots, nautical miles per hour. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. This is so super, super cool. The entire round trip could take 40 days, which means Lisbeth and Edwin should be on their way back from the South Pole when they get to celebrate a drastic, but fantastic, plastic Christmas. Hello and welcome to The Week in Tech. Facebook was again in the news this week as the Digital Media, Culture and Sports Committee released company emails which appeared to show that the social network made secret deals to give app developers special access to users' data. Facebook had objected to the release of the documents and said they were presented in a very misleading manner, which required additional context. It was also the week that the Ministry of Defence carried out its biggest ever exercise of autonomous vehicles. Millions of O2 customers found themselves without data services as the network was hit by software issues. Forbes released its list of the world's highest earning YouTube stars. 
Number one was seven-year-old American toy reviewer Ryan of Ryan Toys Review, who earned over 17 million pounds. Imagine all the toys he could buy. Oh, no way. Top Gun and Mission Impossible star Tom Cruise took time away from climbing, falling, running and saving the world to tell us how to improve the picture quality on our smart TVs. Hint, turn off motion smoothing. And if you're worried that your plants never get enough sun, then this robot plant hybrid by MIT might be right up your garden. Researchers placed electrodes onto its leaves that read signals based on the plant's reaction to light. The signals are then passed on to the wheels underneath, which guide it towards the light. Hey presto, your very own cybernetic life form. Careful not to run over a thorn. Oceans cover 70% of our planet, yet most of us know little about what goes on beneath the surface. So we travel to Norway, which has the second longest coastline in the world, and the country is leading the way in technology aiming to better the health of the sea and to help us protect our planet. This is absolutely stunning. I can't believe that this is part of a day's work. But what we're about to take a look at could be even more impressive. It's not just about the scenery, it's about what's going on under the water. And it's not just about fish and plants, but also what we're going to see which shouldn't be there. So we're putting to the test the Blue Eye Underwater Drone, which is now available for consumers, providing eyes under the water. No goggles needed. As Blue Eye explores the waters here, it's both astonishing and saddening to discover what goes on beneath the flawless surface. I mean, like, we have glow-in-the-dark sharks in Norway. It's really cool, yeah. And in this place, I've found at least five or ten different snails. But in between all of this, there's also a lot of trash. And I think people would be horrified if they see the amount of trash that's located on the bottom of this fjord. It's easier to just drill a hole in your boat and sink it. And this is one of the few places that freeze over during the winter. So they've been just driving the cars out, even trucks. And just when the ice goes, the, the truck goes away and then out of sight, out of mind. The drone's sending the live video feed back to a device on board the boat, whilst the operator can control exposure and camera settings as well as navigating position. OK, so it's underwater now. The footage can either be watched on a phone, tablet or via this digital headset, although it does seem a bit of a waste to block out the surroundings when here. But the very idea is that you don't need to be. The aim being that Blue Eye could give anyone, anywhere, eyes under the sea. I sincerely feel that to make people want to take care of the ocean, you have to, you know, place the love for the ocean, you know, in here and up here. So you have to know what you want to take care of and you also have to have this emotional relationship to it. So by bringing the ocean floor into people's homes is really great way to make people just appreciate what's down there and just make them really have this inner motivation to do some slight changes in their life. The shores here have been the test bed for plenty of other innovation too. Even the boat we travelled on is drowning in sensors, tracking temperature, water depth, pH levels, currents and if there are any signs of life below, allowing that data to be saved and analysed. But whilst these ideas may help us get a clearer view beneath the sea, to better the situation, us humans clearly need to improve our behaviour. Wow, that was Lara in Norway. Back at the plants, I'm learning that recycling plastic isn't as simple as just melting it all down. Your milk bottle is made from a different plastic to your cola bottle and your yoghurt container, so they all need to be separated. This is a really interesting way of separating different types of plastic at high speed. So here's all the plastic whizzing down this conveyor belt, most of it 
falls off the end, but there is a near infrared sensor just above the gap and it's looking for a particular type of plastic. When it spots it, a little air jet shoots just that bit of plastic up into the air and it jumps over the gap and into the special collection pond. That's really clever. Finnish company Zen Robotics is now building on this technology, adding 3D sensors, high-res cameras, metal detectors and machine learning to the mix. Its heavy picker can spot many different materials with high precision. And the sad truth is the vast majority of plastics are rejected by recycling plants because they're not fit for reuse. But now there's a company in Silicon Valley that thinks it's found a way to break down those plastics so they don't find their way into our oceans. Dave Lee reports. This is a story that starts with a pile of this, which is put into this. You then whir it around a bit in here, and then eventually it becomes this, or this. It's easy when you know how. Let's start from the beginning. I'm visiting Bioselection. They're a tiny company experimenting with what could be a revolutionary new recycling technique. The company was formed by two young entrepreneurs who wanted to do something about this. The enormous, almost unthinkably large global plastic crisis. You think that when you put it into the blue bin, it's going off to a good place. When they are mechanically recycled, the products are not valuable enough to justify the processing cost. Right, so that's why they end up in the landfill. So you just stick them in landfill anyway. Okay. Right. And so Bioselection is focusing on this stuff, the plastic film you often see as packaging or wrapped around food. In fact, this is the most common type of plastic, but right now it's the least recycled of all. So this plastic, um, if you envision, it's a really long chain of carbon, right? So just carbon, carbon, carbon atoms and thousands of them. And what our catalyst is able to do is basically cut this chain into selective uh, small molecules. So we're talking about, you know, like from thousands of carbons to like four carbons. On. And those products are very valuable. Now, they wouldn't show us the entire technique on camera, but the end result is what's known as a chemical intermediate, and it forms the building blocks for other materials, such as nylon. It can also be used to make electrical components. Bioselection is the first company to achieve this with recycled plastic film. Our process, we're talking about hours. Wow. Just after hours, um, it becomes this. Huh. We consider this upcycling, right? Yes. And we're, we're not exactly making the same thing, but we're making something else that is more valuable and it actually displaces petroleum use, right? Because we're, we're using plastic waste instead of petroleum. There is, of course, an awful long way to go before the hard work here can make a dent in the enormous amount of plastic we chuck into landfill every year. The plan is to take this process and bring it on the road. How do you take this idea from being in a lab like this and scaling it to an extent that it can help solve this global plastics problem that we have? We would like to make uh, a piece of equipment that can process this material fairly efficiently, which we would locate on site. And then the product we would take to, you know, some kind of a, a central site where we would purify it to our specifications. The company has raised $3 million in funding so far, but in Silicon Valley, that's pocket change. If this plan works, it could be a very big deal. That was Dave Lee. Climate predictions are based on solid data, some going back as far as a few hundred years. In Reading, at the National Centre for Atmospheric Research, the old weather instruments are still in use alongside the modern ones. Now the reason that they're still using these pretty old-fashioned devices is for consistency. So you know the readings that you're getting today were measured in exactly the same way they were 100 or 150 years ago. Supercomputers crunch sea, ice and dust data from past years and try to simulate the weather that occurred in each year. Now it's been fine-tuned to correctly reflect what actually happened researchers have started changing the environment and watching the effects. 
what we can do with a model is that we can lower the temperature in this part of the world and see whether or not we still produce that many hurricanes. I'm assuming then you have done that, you have lowered the sea temperature to see how it yes. affected the number of hurricanes, what happened? That certainly played a role. We think about half of the hurricanes were produced because the sea surface temperature was that warm in that year. Professor Vidal also told me that in the future, tropical storms are predicted to originate further north and importantly, curve east and back towards Europe. So that means that parts of the world that have never had to be hurricane ready before have to start yes. thinking hurricanes. Yes, they do. But the search is on for cleaner, greener forms of energy. The most established alternative to burning fossil fuels is solar power. And Lara has sailed to a very special island just off Norway. We've travelled west now to Oost, Norway. It is so calm here, it's absolutely beautiful. But not far from here, the waves can reach up to three metres. And that's where we're heading, because we're going to go and take a look at an island which is made up of solar panels. And the idea is that they need to fare OK, whatever the weather. Okay. Oh, thank you. I've made it. Wow, we're walking on water. These certainly aren't the first floating solar panels, but the innovation being tested here is the fabric itself, creating a cost-effective, weather-resistant material that could easily be scaled. There's talk of a setup near the equator the size of a football pitch. This has been designed to withstand wind, rain and ice. But round the edges, these barriers prevent any seawater from getting in. So whilst you can see I'm standing in a pretty large puddle right now, that's from last night's rain. What I'm actually standing on is less than a millimetre thick and it really feels that it's quite hard to stay balanced. It's made from polyester coated in a polymer. And what makes this polymer special is how lightweight yet strong it is, meaning it's ideal for this type of installation. In not that distant future, we think we can build systems that are comparable with the so-called ground mount installations on land. And that will be a big breakthrough for photovoltaics, because then you have suddenly large surface areas where you can build cheap renewable energy, very close to large consumer groups. And making use of just a fraction of the sea's vast surface area, as well as taking advantage of the water's ability to keep the panels cool, means that the scaling of this does seem plausible. The solar power being harnessed is being used here on this fish farm. Now, the island has been developed to be the exact right size to harness the right amount of power in the summertime. That's presuming that the weather's good. The rest of the year, it's running on diesel. So, obviously, you can see the environmental benefits of this. But the suggestion is that an island this size, if anchored in the London area, could power 20 average UK homes. Make the island the size of a football pitch and that could rise to 200. But of course the investment needed is huge, so moving forward on this could prove more complicated than the proof of concept. That was Lara in Norway. You know, if you've seen the Pixar film Wally, -E, you'll know that in the distant future, the Earth gets covered in cubes of rubbish like this, mountains of these cubes and humanity has to leave. And at the moment, no matter how much recycling we do, I get the feeling that that future is getting more and more likely. Something's got to be done. See ya.